and welcome. Now we're going to do, uh, in this lesson, we're going to do integrals. Actually, double integrals. In polar coordinates. Okay, so what do we mean by polar coordinates? Well, recall that if we have... Um, we're in the xy plane, right? Something like this. Uh, when we have a x and y, we can. There's our x and there's our y right there. Okay, and okay, we can always take a point and we could represent it in polar coordinates by using a transformation uh, uh, from sine and cosine to r and theta coordinates. So we can always go back and forth between r and theta so we can have a representation of the xy point xy right there in terms of r and theta so how do we do that well it's straightforward we know that r squared is going to be x squared plus y squared that's the standard pythagorean theorem so here we have x on this uh, measure there and then we measure y on the y-axis as such and that's just uh, if we take x squared y squared, we know the hypotenuse has to be uh, r squared. We sum the two squares together. All right, finally, and then if I want to get x, then uh, x will be r cosine theta, and y will be r sine theta. Okay, all fine and good. But now what we want to do is uh, be able to talk about um, how to integrate over domains that THAT are circular, circular like. So it could be circles, but it also could be um, annuli and other uh, shapes that have circle components to them. So, what do we mean by that? So, here's our Cartesian plane again. Let's say I'm talking about some region that has a circle-like look to it. So this, of course, goes back to the origin, like that. All right, if I have a domain that looks like this, this is my domain. All right, so I want to integrate over some domain, some function. Over some, I want to integrate a double integral over some sort of shape that looks like this. Well, I could break it into uh, squares, like xy squares, so our dA be equal to dx times dy, uh, but it doesn't seem to break up really nicely into nice squares, and this is a kind of a cumbersome domain to, to figure out bounding functions for it. We certainly could do it, but what's better is to think about these as little slices of pi. So if I think about this angle right here, if I think about this angle as delta theta, and I think about this angle here is delta r, and this little piece, this little wedge here, is really a wedge of a much larger annulus that goes off and around the circle like so. So how do we find the area? What is delta a, if you will, that creates this sort of area? All right, so we think of this angle here as uh, angle alpha, so down here right there, that's theta equals alpha, and right here is uh, theta equals beta. Okay, and we think here is this point right here to that point, that's going to be point A, and that's going to be point B equals R, and that A there is going to be equal to R down there. Okay, so with those basic pieces of information, we want to be able to, to transformation to and from Cartesian coordinates, i.e. this xy plane type stuff, to polar coordinates and see if we can find a, a, a way to estimate delta A in terms of, of delta A, or sorry, um, just go back here a little bit, in terms of delta R. So delta R, of course, will be the distance there delta theta, r theta, things like that. Okay, so how do we do that? So let's, let's, let's do the calculation to figure it out. 
So if we're thinking of the entire an entire annulus going all the way around, like that, right? So here is our A point, and there's our our B point. What's the area inside of that? The area is of course going to be pi times b squared minus pi times a squared, right? That's going to be the area inside this annulus, which is basically just the outer circle area minus the inner circle area. I could also write that as pi of b squared minus a squared. All right, so that's if delta theta, in a sense, is 2 pi, the full rotation around the circle. And that creates this weighting factor of pi, which represents essentially the, the, the half of the, represents uh, the, uh, the, the, the um, half diameter of each circle. All right, so if, that's, if delta theta in this case for the whole annulus is 2 pi, then if I want to try to find a wedge, something smaller than that, we know we have to, uh, uh, we have to uh, um, take a smaller slice. So if that's 2 pi, then we get a pi sitting there. If I get a smaller little wedge here, if I go from here to here, let's say, take a smaller little wedge, what fraction of, of pi is it going to be? Well, if, if the whole thing is 2 pi, if I have some other fraction, we know it has to be, um, it has to be, um, it has to be, um, um, sorry, I'm getting a little tripped up here. Well, it has to be then that, uh, that the area delta A for a tiny wedge shape right there, a little wedge shape that's like that has to be, uh, it's going to be delta theta, whatever this angle is here, uh, divided by 2 times b squared minus a squared. Okay, why does it have to be that? Well, again, if, 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 if theta, if delta theta is the entire, if, if we're going to move this all the way around, all 2 pi, all the way back to here, going to cover the whole circle, this has to equal pi. But uh, if we want just part of the angle, just a small little bit of the entire circle, we just divide by 2 to make the, the math work out. Oh, so that looks nice. And now we see here we have a difference of squares. So why don't we try expanding this, delta theta over 2, the difference of squares factors really nicely. Beta plus a, uh, or sorry, b plus a and b minus a. Okay, that works out really nice. So I'm going to rearrange this even further. Delta theta. Um, oops. Sorry. Uh, b plus a over 2. I'm just going to rewrite the 2 there, and I'll show you why I'm going to do that in a second. And b minus a, we already knew that was delta r. Okay, so we're getting close. All right, so now what is b plus a over 2? Well, b plus a over 2 is actually the average. It's, it's actually this point right there. It's the, and I'm going to call that ri, and that represents uh, a point, in, a midpoint between a and b, right? So I'm going to call that ri. That is a representative midpoint for this tiny, this tiny wedge of a circle, of an annulus. So, so we can rewrite this again as equal to delta theta delta r times r i. Okay, so now um, that equals our delta a. Okay. All right, so what do we do with this? All right, so now I'm going to go to a new sheet here. Okay, if we know that delta A is equal to uh, Ri times delta R times delta theta, and we have some region of space that's annuli-like, we want to break it up into a bunch of little sub-wedges sub of... of so this is our big, our big domain. And we're going to break it up into little, we'll call them polar rectangles. So those are called polar rectangles. And so what's the area of each one of those? So delta A I for this little tiny 
rectangle is going to equal to the midpoint there, Ri, from the center of the circle, from the center of the, of the plane, all the way to there. And it's going to have a particular delta theta right, coming in. So that delta theta there is going to be uh, delta theta. It's going to be the, the tiny little angle displacement right there. And then finally, uh, we're going to have a delta r which is going to be every little increment, polar increment, and magnitude going out away from the circle. So we think of that as then Ri delta R delta theta. All right, and then now if we have this function over this region, we want to have this integral over this domain of f of x, y, dA, we can then approximate it as the following. We can say, take the angle from angle alpha to angle beta, and then take the radius from A to B, A to B, right there, and then use our polar coordinate transformation. X, of course, is R uh, times cosine theta, comma, R sine theta, and now dA here, we're going to rewrite it as R, which is going to be our midpoint for each of our small little intervals, dR, d theta. So again, as before, this represents the abstract, abstract representation of this integral over this domain, but we need to find some constructive way, so this is the constructive form or the uh, uh, constructive or operational operational um, form of the integral. This gives us a systematic way of computing this thing. Sorry, we need to put a parenthesis on there and the f. So now let's talk about a specific example. There's one I really like. Let's talk about f of x comma y is equal to sine of x squared plus y squared. All right, so what does this look like? And I'm going to pick a domain that I want to integrate over. I'm going to pick, over, pick a domain that's equal to all the points x comma y in the Cartesian plane such that x squared plus y squared is less than or equal to um, pi. Okay, so what does this look like? So we might want to uh, plot to see what this domain looks like. So I'm going to pull up MATLAB here. Okay. So what I'm going to do here, bring this onto the screen here. So I'm going to make my dr here to be 0 0.025, and my d theta, which I'll call dth, and that's going to be equal to 0 0.025. And then again, I'm going to make a mesh grid. So r and theta are going to be a mesh grid uh, from 0 all the way to square root of pi. So what does this look like here? Of course, this, this domain uh, is going to be a circle of radius. Apologies for the terrible square root of pi. Okay, it's apologies for this terrible looking circle. But that's the domain. We're going to integrate over a circle like this, which of course contains many annuli. All right. So that's the rate, that's the r dimension is going to be from zero all the way to the square root of pi. And then the theta dimension is of course be the entire angular rotation all the way from zero through increments of dth all the way to two pi. All right, and again, we take our x variable, and we construct that out of r and, r and theta, and y out of r and theta. And then we make our z variable, which is our sine x squared plus y squared. All right, so let's run this, let's run this script to see what kind of plot this creates. All right, great. So it looks kind of like a, a, a I don't know, a bunt cake pan. So uh, if you've ever uh, had a bunt cake, it's just some sort of donut like kind of like a I don't know what you call it but it's a it's a cake mold for now what I want to do is is find what the uh, what the area is under this I want to find the volume under this bunt cake pan so now let's uh, close this out and find out what the volume is so again I'm going to write down the double integral over D I'll write down the abstract definition all right and now I'm going to write down a, an approximate integral representation. Actually, sorry, I'm going to make this equal. 
we're going to integrate from 0 to 2 pi. And that's the angular integral. And we're going to integrate from 0 to square root of pi. We're going to put sine. And then what do we know about r squared? We said the change of variables, the uh, change of variables between Cartesian to polar is, contains this relationship that x squared plus y squared equals r squared. I'm going to put an r squared there. And now the dA, we know that dA is actually going to be r dr d theta. All right, so I'm going to put that in its place, r dr d theta. Okay, fine and good now. All right, so how do we take, now this is a constructive version of the integral. Well, this actually contains uh, uh, all the information of this abstract version, but it does it in a way that we can actually compute the integral. All right, so we see that uh, we're going to let, we can see this integral right here, uh, it really lends itself to some sort of change of variables. So I'm going to let u equals r squared. Okay, that looks good. And we know that um, r, uh, so we know that du dr is going to be equal to 2r, which means that du over 2r is equal to dr. So if I rewrite this integral, we keep the angular integral by left alone. And then uh, we have to um, plug in the values. So that becomes 0 to 2, uh, uh, two um, times. OK, remember u was equal to r squared, so that becomes 2 pi, right? Because I put square root of pi, and I plug it in there. Uh, sorry, no, I apologize going to be equal to pi, right? Because if I put square root of pi into r squared, I get pi. And then I get sine u times r, because there, there's the r there. And now everywhere I see a, a, a dr, I can put one of these in its place. So I get a du over 2r and then r d theta. So we get the r's canceling. And then we get a 1 half coming out front. We notice that this integral has nothing to do with theta, so we can actually 0 to 2 pi d theta, move the integrals apart like this. 0 to pi sine u du. Okay, so we can compute this. This is becomes the integral of theta from 0 to 2 pi becomes just uh, 2 pi over 2. Uh, from the one half there. And then finally, the antiderivative of sine is negative cosine u. And we have to evaluate that at zero and pi. Okay. So the twos cancel, and we get a pi times, and here's cosine, negative cosine, so we need it to be uh, cosine of zero minus cosine of pi. That becomes pi times cosine of 0 is 1 minus cosine of pi is minus 1. And that becomes minus and minus 1 becomes 2 pi. So the volume or the area under this curve of this bunt cake, the volume of our bunt cake pan, if you will, is 2 pi. So that gives an example of how to use polar coordinates to do uh, integrals involving uh, circle type regions or annuli or other things where, um, where a transformation from, from Cartesian coordinates actually really aids by doing a much better job by transforming to polar coordinates where things become easy. And the key then is to realize this change of variables. We go from dA becomes R dr d theta. And we want to find out if, there are, if the x, y coordinates that are plugged into our function are somehow easily transformed by these types of change of variables, then this sort of representation works. And commonly, the use of these integrals, or the use of the polar coordinate transformation, works really well when you have domains that are annuli, or circles, or some kind of wedge shape object uh, that uh, lends itself to polar style coordinates. Thank you very much.